thanks, uh, Gabe. It's uh, great to uh, see so many uh, young people here, and I think it's, uh, I'm going to try and uh, maybe ins instill some skepticism in you. So I basi basically Gabe gave me, three, gave me three objectives. So one is, what's the relevance of bioinformatics um, to you guys? Uh, what are the uh, important approaches? And you'll see I'm only going to focus on a small, small fraction. And then discuss the limitations. And I think this, this was the one thing that I insisted on. So I want to start off by saying that, that biomedical science, and it's not just cancer research, it's biomedical science in its totality is an information science now. It's not six mice in a t-test anymore, okay? What we have, and, and so the other thing I'm going to say is right off the bat is that bioinformatics is an extraordinarily broad topic. It ranges from everything from the computer scientists who are developing algorithms uh, that may be biologically relevant all the way down to the person who's doing the analysis uh, uh, after the data has been completely massaged, okay? So it's that whole spread, and I'm only going to focus on a, big, on a part of it, but I'll talk a little bit about, the, uh, about the, the, the reason for that big spread. And then the whole purpose here is we're trying to, just, to get a signal from a whole lot of noise, and I think that's, if there's one thing to remember, it's we're trying to get a signal from a big pile of data. So as I, as I mentioned, we're drowning in a sea of data. We have information from all sorts of sources. So in the background here, I've got genomic information. In the foreground in black, I have protein sequence information. On top of that protein sequence information, we have three-dimensional structures and we have modifications of the proteins and interactions between proteins. So it's not, it, it's, it's incredibly complicated stuff. And availability is not the problem. And I just want to give you a little vignette. So the Human Genome Project, um, yesterday was the anniversary of the release, uh, release one of the Human Genome Project, cost approximately $3 billion. And to a first approximation, all of that money was spent on hands. People to clone the, the people to collect the DNA, to clone it into bacterial, what we call vectors, and to then order those small fragments and then finally to sequence it, and then a little teeny bit of that information, of, the, of that money was spent on the bioinformatics at the back end, okay? But most of it was spent on hands. The Craig Venter Institute uh, sequenced independently, quote, I'm gonna put that in scare quotes, that what they really did is they spent a rounding error of, the, of what the Human Genome Project spent because they could piggyback on top of what had already been done. Today, if you want to sequence a human genome, and today's uh, an auspicious day, it's the Broad Institute's release of the 100,000th human genome. Today, if you want to sequence a human genome, all of that hands, the $3 billion in hands, is about $4,000 in technician time in about two hours. All right? All, to a first approximation, I'll show you some numbers in a minute, to a first approximation, all the money is spent on the bioinformatics. Okay? And most of the time. Data, again, data availability is not the, the problem. Here's the, co the cost per human genome from about the turn of the century when the Human Genome Project was released to today. And the, basically, this is the cost to sequence a human genome now is roughly $1,000, ballpark, $1,500, depends who you ask and you know, how much profit they want to make. Um, we, we have various high-throughput sequencing platforms that are illustrated here. And today, the $1,000 is because we have a massive parallelization and a lot of read length. And that's really the, the issue that's, that, that's helped drop the, the price. Again, availability. There's probably more information in the databases than we'll ever get around to analyzing ever. Um, so we can, it, in the old days when I was a young spring chicken, um, we sequenced genes by hand, and that's the blue line, and you can sort of see the amount of information that goes in the databases over time uh, as, as a function of sequencing genes by hand. When the high throughput platforms were developed, you can see the red line. People stop sequencing one gene because I can just sequence a whole genome. Why not? Okay? Honestly, that's, that's the thought process. Um, in a couple of weeks, I'm going to the EBI, uh, European Bioinformatics Institute, where I'm going to meet with the people that look after these databases. And one of the problems that they have is that they physically cannot draw enough power into the system to store the information. So they have to come up with brand new ways to store this data. There's, that's how much data there is. So when, you, when you hear big data, it's not big until you're in this scale, where you don't, can't, actually can't bring enough power to, to store it. Never mind analyze it, just to store it. Okay, so that's just raw data. 
So let's look at one puny little pathway, so which might be familiar to some of you, P53. So P53 is mutated in a lot of cancers. It's mutated in many ovarian cancers, probably half or more. This is not the only pathway, but what I want you to focus on is not the specifics. This is a fairly old slide. I want you to focus in on the generalities. So what we have is we have multiple inputs. You know, we have DNA damage and hypoxia and, and you know, nucleotide depletions and all sorts of things that can happen to a cell. Okay? These inputs can act synergistically or independently. They can act sequentially. And they go through these mediator molecules. These are all proteins. These mediator molecules then feed into the black box, which has P53 and its interacting and modulating partners. So that's just, I mean, we can just treat them as names for, for this point. But what happens inside that, block, that black box is that we have protein modifications, we have protein inhibition, we have protein activation. And out of that black box flows the, the, the output. Okay, so that output can be, can be cell cycle arrest, or it might be um, apoptosis. It's the same black box, and, but we're getting different outputs. So we have, under, misunder, we have um, uh, some holes in our knowledge, shall we say, and th th you know, that's an area of active research, is filling in the holes in our knowledge to go from the inputs to a specific output. Okay? One of the things I'm going to focus on just a little bit is I'm going to try and build, build up a, a little bit of a story as to, as to how we collect some data and then what we do with that in the end and bring it back around to talking about the system such as this. So just to remind you, and, and this is not because I don't think you know what the central dogma is. I, I kind of like to, to point this out because this is what science used to look like, okay, like paper notebooks written by hand. This is some of Francis's Crick, uh, Francis Crick's uh, uh, notebook uh, when he came up with the central dogma. I just want to remind you that we have DNA, which is the genomic sequence, about two meters in, our, in each cell. We have proteins, which I've mentioned. They have, they're, they're doing the function, and the intermediate is uh, mRNA. So this is a 30,000-foot view from a genome browser view of the human genome at the P53, the site where the P53 gene uh, resides. So the blue is the P53 gene. It's, again, 30,000 feet. The green, the green lines, there's not one P53 gene, not one P53 mRNA. There are 15 or 16. I want to say that if we, if we have the sequence of the genome, and we do, um, we actually are very bad at identifying the protein coding sequences, the parts of the genome that actually do something uh, at the protein level. So this... The, the, green block, the green parts are the transcripts, which are, de which are determined by sequencing RNA, mRNAs. The open boxes, or the big boxes, are the parts that make it out into the cytoplasm. The thin boxes are the parts that stay inside the nucleus. They, they're called introns and exons. Below, if you look in the database, we have the ensemble gene, and that's sort of the canonical gene, okay? So that's what is down below. And then we have two lines below in blue. Uh, the, the top blue line is the variants that have been determined by whole genome sequencing in the genome, and you can sort of see they're sort of spread out. And then you can see the variants that have clinical significance. And if you look up, those variants of clinical significance map to um, the exons, the parts of the, of the gene that make the protein. So if we have P53 as a central player and we notice that there are variants in P53, that can help us determine drug targets, for example, or how the, how the tumor might behave. So we have the human genome sequence. We can co collect new sequence of the tumor, and it should be a simple mapping operation. You know, it's just like finding the word the in, a, in, a, in, in War and Peace. You know, how many times does the word the occur in War and Peace, for example? It's just a simple string, what we call a string matching problem. But I'm going to say that even something as simple as that is hard bioinformatically. So I just want to remind you a little bit where, where, infra, where the sequence information comes from. So we have DNA or RNA. We break it into little tiny pieces. We generate what's called a library. We put it on a sequencer machine. And then we get those little tiny fragments and we map them to the genome. Okay? And so that's what those blue lines are over top of the, the horizontal line. So we're mapping to the genome, and then from that mapping, we can then determine what the sequence variants are. And then hopefully downstream, we can determine what's happening with what those sequence variants tell us about the tumor. 
So you'd think that something as simple as mapping to the genome would be a solved simple problem. Well, it's not. Okay? This is the simplest possible operation that we can do. So for example, there are five, at least five, probably closer to 20, tools that you can use to map sequences to a genome. And so here's five, five or six of them. Novo Align, Bowtie, Star, Mac, and, and BWA. And I'm embarrassed to say I've used them all. Okay? Every single one of them. Um, the colors inside the, 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 uh, the, the, the uh, pie charts, I struggle with the name because I never use them and you shouldn't either. The colors inside the, inside part, the bar charts, or the, 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 the pie charts, indicate the strategies that they take to make mapping something that takes hours, not months. So they make approximations, and the approximations that they make affect the output. So every mapping tool that you use is going to give you a slightly different answer. That's sort of a problem. I say that algorithmic strategies differ. So this is the simplest thing you can do. Once you've got them mapped, you have to determine what's a variant, what is a variant. Now, calling sequence variants in cancer cells is a hard problem. It's hard enough when you're calling variants from a, from a, in, in, in um, germline uh, tissue. It's very difficult in cancer because you're dealing with heterogeneous tissues. There's a lot of things going on inside of a tumor, not just the actual tumor cells, and the tumor cell, tumors themselves are heterogeneous. So here's four common tools using the same mapping, and we're, using, we're sequencing the whole genome on the, uh, in part A, or just targeted genes. We're just sequencing the genes that we think are involved in this cancer on, 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 in part B. And you can see that these mapping pipelines don't agree. So different mapping tools give you different answers. Different mapping pipelines give you different answers. This is a common theme in bioinformatics. Different bioinformatics tools give you different answers. Okay, so we'll come back to this. Once you've got, let's, let's assume that our mappers work perfectly, our sequence variant callers work perfectly, and we have a set of variants that we want to determine. What do these variants tell us about the tumor? So we're going to use classification now. So we have a bunch of different ways that we can do this. So one of them is we can use um, databases and compare those variants against known databases of variants. And then we can do de novo classification. And ultimately, we're working towards a network analysis and then what's happening in the system. So here's a partial list of the databases. Now, a few years ago, the, the, the first one on the, on the list is a thousand genomes project. As I said, this was a, a, a multi-institution, multinational project to sequence a thousand genomes. One institution now, the Broad Institute, has released their hundred thousandth genome today. Okay? So the thousand genomes project is in its own way kind of quaint. Okay? And it goes back to, we're still exponentially increasing the amount of information. But these databases, the databases of populations, are incredibly important because they tell us if, you care, if those variants are found in the populations, they're benign. You don't care. You can not care about them. So you build a database that you, of, da of stuff that actually so that you know what you don't care about. Then there are other cancer-specific databases which you can use to say, okay, this, is, this variant has been seen in all, in, in these kind of tumors all the time. So it's probably important, okay? And then there are other databases. So it would probably shock you to learn that, for example, GenBank, or the DNA database of Japan, or EMBL, to a first approximation is Wikipedia. We could sit here and type up a sequence and submit it, and it would probably stay there for a very long time, okay? So we have to curate these databases and annotate them in some way, or somebody has to. Okay, so once you've got your variants, you can classify them by effect by looking in these databases. And there are basically four classifications um, that, that, uh, that have been worked out. Uh, there's a standards and guidelines document that I'm working from here. So tier one variants are those variants where if you see that variant, you have a pretty good idea what the treatment plan is, okay? So these are, these, there's not very many of these, relatively speaking, but if you have a tier one variant, you know what, the, what your plan is gonna be. If you have a tier two variant, you, you have an idea that there's at least something in mice, for example, or in a different tumor type that might work in this particular cancer. And if you have a tier four variant, it's been seen in the general population, assumed to be healthy, who cares? 
The tier three variants are kind of interesting. The tier three variants are those where they're not in the databases and they're not benign. So they're private to the tumor. And there's a huge number of these. And ovarian cancers especially have a lot of private, private mutations. Here we use prediction tools. And you should never use these prediction tools clinically. There's a, anytime you see a lot of bioinformatic tools, you can be assured, rest assured, that nobody knows what's going on. Okay, honestly. If there's 50 tools, that means that, that there's, a, there's a cottage industry of MSc students who have never done biology since grade nine that are, that are churning out tools for their theses. Okay, it's not quite that bad. But it's, 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 it's not that far off in some cases. We have two things that we're interested in. Are we getting variants that are in the protein coding region that are gonna change the sequence of the protein, change its behavior? Those are missense variants. Or are we getting variants that are gonna change the splicing? That is how the exons and introns are put together. And it's those, that's why we have 16 at least uh, different uh, uh, mRNAs that encode P53 that I showed you earlier. There are different ways that you can combine those exons and introns together. Okay, so you've got, so now you've got your sequence variants and you're gonna combine it with, for example, um, uh, 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 protein modifications, so you know, protein phosphorylation, uh, uh, ubiquitination, all sorts of modifications to the protein. You're going to combine it with metabolomic output. So what are the small molecules that are in the tumor? You're going to combine it with what's called methylation, which is, gives you an idea of gene expression in the tumor. You're going to combine that with uh, uh, gene expression th data itself. And you can put all of that into a big black box and generate, f identify which tumors are closer together and which tumors, or which tumors are closer together or more similar and which tumors are further apart or more, or more dissimilar. And this is what network analysis is. And so um, this paper came out a couple of weeks ago. It's in cell and it's the cell of origin pattern, uh, cell, of, cell of origin patterns dominate the molecule. 10,000 tumors and uh, they can classify them to 33 different types of cancer. And what they, the big, the take home is in the title is that cell of origin dominates pathology or histology. So they came up with 25 clusters, so they're all named here. And to a first approximation, many of these clusters map to unique types of cancers. Okay, so cluster six is ovarian cancer. Cluster 19 is breast cancer, for example. Um, I, can't, I can't find prostate. I think cluster 20 is prostate, for example. So the clusters group largely by disease but they don't group by histopathology. So the molecular behavior of a cancer of a tumor um, is, does not necessarily correlate with its histopathology and it almost is completely uncorrelated with its immune subtype. So this just came out a couple weeks ago uh, uh, and it's the largest study from the TCAG group uh, to date. But what the groups do correlate is with drug targets. So for example, um, response to androgens, so cluster, cluster 16 is the prostate cancer one. So cluster 16 is, of course, is, is sensitive to androgen um, blocking drugs. Cluster uh, 19, yeah, it's okay. Cluster 19 is the breast cancer group, and they're sensitive to estrogen blocking uh, uh, drugs, for example. And so you can sort of look down the line and see, okay, I've got my clusters, I've got my, uh, my disease types, and you know, what, what uh, drug might, be, might work in this particular case. And so if you have a tumor and you can phenotype it using these molecular diagnostics, you can then identify what um, drugs might actually work. And that's much more powerful than the histopathology or the immune subtype. All right, so now we've got a situation where we have a whole lot of information at the molecular level on a particular tumor or particular types of tumors. So we're gonna, we're gonna switch from a reductionist approach where we start with cells, tissue, or disease and break it down into the molecules. And we're gonna start with the properties of the molecules and build that back up to give us emergent properties of the system. So this is, that's systems biology. And systems biology and the reductionist approach that we're, that, that, you know, like biochemistry, um, uh, physiology, is really, they're really uh, polar opposites, but they depend upon each other. And so here's an example of a systems biology approach. And so one of the key uh, pathways that often go, goes wrong in cancer is apoptosis. So this is the apoptotic pathway for, I don't have my notes in front of you, but it's trail. So it's tumor necrosis, something or other induced ligand. I don't remember exactly what it is. But the, 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 the signal is 
trail, and then the output is, a, is cleavage of a, a protein called PARP. And so if you cleave PARP, apoptosis is assured, okay? So in the systems biology approach, each one of those nodes inside the box is a different molecule, and it's encoded with its, math with its properties that you can uh, mathematically determine if I have this signal, what are the, what's the likelihood of that output for each of those, uh, those uh, molecules? The ones in red and green are the ones that are actually controlling the rate at which PARP is cleaved, okay, according to this model. So what they can do is they can start perturbing the system and see how, that, how well that lines up with reality. And the bottom right is the correlation between how the system behaves in the computer and how that system behaves in the cell. And so, there, so it's a pretty good uh, description. The, co the computer-based system is a pretty good description of the cell, which tells us that we have very good knowledge of how this system works in the cell. So now we can, in the computer, in silico, begin to, to probe and poke at that and identify which, which proteins might be the ones that we want to, to, to really focus on for drug targets. So now I'm going to talk a little bit about some limitations, very quickly. So one of them is that we have so much data, we don't really need new, more data. But a lot of, but high profile journals love new data sets, much more than they love new tools. So, um, and, and this is, I like this quote, I just thought it was, there's reason to believe that the data we already have is more than enough, to, than we, more than we need to, re, to improve the treatment of ovarian cancer, if we can figure out how to analyze it properly. So the other limitation is the standard of truth. We don't know what causes cancer, we don't know how to treat it very well. My, my, my mother and my aunt died of ovarian cancer. So I know this for a fact. And the problem is we, don't, we really don't have a good handle on it. We don't know what we're dealing with. We don't, have a, we don't have a pure standard of truth. So any model that we make is not based upon reality, but it's based upon our perception of reality. And it's the old you know, philosoph blind philosophers and the elephant problem. The databases themselves are a limitation. I, I told you that you can put anything that you want into a database. If the databases that are curated, you need to know how they're curated, you need to know the source of the information, the purpose and how it was validated. You need to know the limits of the information for the database and you know, where it came from, what, are the, what, what, are the, what version is it. The algorithms, so this is a big one. Different algorithms I showed you give different results on the, on, on the same data set, never mind different data sets. There's potentially unlimited combinations of algorithms to test. If you have 25 different ways of doing something, there's a lot of ways you can combine that to try and get an answer. We have an imperfect knowledge of the system. I talked about that. And then what's important? So what's important to the person who developed the algorithm is typically the time it takes, the precision, and its recall. What's important to you is, is it easy to use? Can I, can I change its features? And does it actually work? Okay. Bioinformatics costs. So this is one of my personal bugaboos. Um, <clears throat> it, 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 with, with spe especially with clinicians, and I'm sorry, but I have to get this off my chest, but typically somebody will collect a big data set and they'll, they'll spend you know, a few months or maybe half a year collecting a big data set. My grant's tomorrow. No, I'm sorry. To a first approximation, so here's data from the UBC Genome Center. So in 2013, they spent $15,000 to collect the data and $5,000 to analyze it per patient. 14,000 in 2015 and 5,000 to analyze it. 2017, 2,000, still that 5,000 per patient to analyze it, okay? So the bioinformatics is, is, a, is a fixed cost, all right? And it's a fixed time, and it's probably the biggest part because you got to get it right. And, the, and part of this is because it's, there's rapidly changing standards and methods. Um, uh, I've received sequencing outputs where the the format of the file, and the file is something that is, you know, a gigabyte, gigabyte in, in size, changed in the middle of the, in the file, because the machine was updated in the middle of the run, okay? So you're not gonna deal with this data in Excel. The biggest limitation is the communication. So typically we think of bioinformatics as being a collaboration between biomedical science and computer science. We don't speak the same language. This is a model of Trump's wall, by the way. We don't speak the same language. In biomedical science, um, we're, we know that we can't, for the most part, say if this, if this occurs, that's gonna happen. We have, we have to use some weasel words, okay? It's not a binary system. 
Computer science is very binary. It's yet yes or no, black and white. And the way that computer scientists think is very different from the way biomedical scientists think. But the biggest problem is that computer scientists, um, computer scientists are, have a different set of priorities, time, accuracy, pre time, precision, recall, than we do. And um, sometimes they forget about the statistical approach. And, I'm gonna, and so there's a, less of a barrier between the computer sciences and the stats is a smaller wall. But there's a huge barrier between biomedical sciences and statistical sciences to, a, and to, the, to the point where nature has a whole series of papers on statistics for biologists. And if you read through them, the take home message is, please don't bother find a statistician for the love of God. Okay? So I'm gonna give you an example of the, the difference between a, 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 computer, a comp computational biology approach of looking at something and a statistical approach of looking at something. So there's a paper that came out again a few months ago called, which was come up with what's called the Cancer Seek panel. And for ovarian cancer, it looked like it was really, really good. It was 98% 98 specific, 99% 98 sensitive, 99% specific. And this got into science because they sold it as a screening tool for the population. So bioinformatics has given, gave us the targets, the allele frequencies, uh, and did the analysis, the outputs. And so if you're using a screening algorithm, here's the, th the thought process you have to go through. You have a population that can have cancer or not, and then in the cancers that you can detect it or miss it, and in the healthy population, you can tell somebody that they have cancer when they don't, or you can get it right, okay? So here's the screening utility, and I, uh, if, if the number is wrong here, you can change the number and it's not gonna change the, change the output. But I took this number for the, the, um, the, the, the likelihood, the lifetime, age-adjusted likelihood of ovarian cancer in the, in the Canadian population. Um, every website I look at is a slightly different number, but I'm assuming it's, it's, it's a seven in a thousand. If you have a population of 100,000, that would mean that 700 people would, ha would be predicted to have ovarian cancer, and of those, given the sensitivity of the test, you'd I'd correctly identify 686 of them, and you'd miss 14, so that's not so bad. The problem is that you have 99,300 people that don't have ovarian cancer, but you only have a 99% uh, specificity, which means that 993 people would go, would have that test and say, and, and think that they have ovarian cancer. That's a very scary thing for somebody. And then you have to validate that. So it's not such a great tool, which means that the, after the test, your likelihood of, of, if you test positive, is still only 40%. As a diagnostic, this is fabulous. So change your population. If you have a population now of 1,000 people who come into your clinic and they think they have ovarian cancer, I don't know whether maybe it's 50-50 that actually turn out to have ovarian cancer. Same, same numbers, 98% of those 500, you, uh, you find almost all of them and you exclude almost all the ones that don't. So thinking about st the way the statistics works is actually a huge issue that you need to, need to keep in mind. Okay, to summarize. Biomedical sciences are, are information rich. We're trying to bring order from chaos. The standard of truth or the lack thereof is a big problem. We don't really know what we're looking for. We can, we're, we're sort of bootstrapping our way in. All tools have flaws. We don't know what they are. And we need to collaborate and communicate outside our comfort zones. So thank you. We've got time for questions. I think Greg gave a terrific overview of the challenges and, and where we are with bioinformatics in, in medicine and, and biomedical research today. Um, any obvious questions out there right now? Jake. I think uh, comfort zone is a, is a good place to end, maybe. So I have a, a master's in, um, in epidemiology, and I've actually had the chance to do some work with you, and you shot down the rigor of what we had done, and probably <laughs> rightly so. Um, but what I found in that interaction was that I really didn't understand the type of uh, analysis that you were doing, and so um, I think collaboration is important. But the question I have is when you read these papers, you know, we developed this methodology to analyze the data set. How can we really trust that the methodology that has been developed um, is accurate? And how does someone like you read any paper without saying that methodology is, uh, is crap? I, I think I'd spend all my time writing letters to the editor if I was you. Yeah, um, so I, I think that, we, I, I think I don't, I don't want to say that, that um, we shouldn't be developing new tools. I think that we have to develop new tools. And I think we sh what we shouldn't do is get attached to old tools. So I think 
Um, as people identify flaws in, in tools, we need new ways of analyzing the data. And so we, what we shouldn't do is become attached to, like the worst kind of tool development paper in my mind is, I developed this new tool and look, it's 20% faster and it gives me exactly the same answer as this tool developed 15 years ago. They're probably wrong. I don't care if it goes faster. What's it, what, do you, what, that, what does this tool give me that the existing tools don't? And why? And do you really understand the data? I think that's the, that's the, that's the, the fundamental way that I, that I would look at those, at those papers. Are they giving you something new, or is it just faster with more options? So, so Greg, you know, I, uh, I'm just getting into starting to do some bioinformatics on, on some of the data that we have. And, you know, I'm relying on other people to choose the tools because I'm not a bioinformatician. So I, what advice, do you, you know, a new scientist in this area do you give? I mean, in the sense that should you be smart and use multiple tools and then look at the, look at the data and see what correlates between those multiple tools and that's the real data? And, and be careful about interpreting other things. Well, I, I think, so I think, you know, one way that people often deal with, deal with these problems is that they will use multiple tools and then take the intersect of, the, of what they find. And that, that's probably closer to the truth as long as those tools are actually truly independent in the way that they are looking at and dealing with the information. Um, in the RNA-seq field, right, where, where I spend most of my time, many of the tools are based upon exactly the same assumptions. And so just because you get the same answer with two different tools doesn't mean that it's the right yeah. answer. It means that it fits the assumptions of the tool. Um, so I think it depends. It's, I'm old enough to remember when I had to know what, how, how to make my own buffers, for example. Whereas now, the biomedical scientists, the, 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 the trainees, everything's in a kit. And it's like $3 billion to make the library that we could then sequence the human genome 20 years ago versus an hour of technician's time and maybe 24 hours on the machine today. So all of that $3 billion is reduced down to a little kit now. And so you have to understand how the kit works in order to interpret the data. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And I think that's kind of one of the things that gets lost is, is, and it's the same with the bioinformatic tool. The tool works because of assumptions and methodologies just like the wet lab tools work. But I guess what you're saying is that you really need to have bioinformaticians on board and don't try to do it yourself. It's like what you said well, about you, stats. You, don't you, do stats. You, you, have to, you have to have them on board and they have to understand the biology at, the same, at the same time and you have to make an effort yeah. to understand the bioinformatics. To get the bioinformatician to explain the tool to you yeah. and you explain the biology until you meet, yeah. um, it, it can take a long time. Yeah. <laughs> okay. Thanks very much, Greg. Great.